Christoph, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to come and visit your fantastic headquarters here in Brixen. No, welcome to the headquarters in Brixen and fantastic that we can meet in real life finally, as I promised over a year ago. I over a year ago when we did the old we'll Skype, yeah, precisely. Yeah. I will just jump directly into it. Absolutely. Um, I take that, I, when I see Durst from the outside, it looks like a very big success on almost every segment that you are operating in. And um, I, was just, I was just curious about, does all your success come from pure luck? <laughs> no, I think pure luck is a good factor, but uh, no, it's actually hard work and it's some stubbornness. And if you see the mountains around, you may understand it because you know, you need some stubbornness to survive here in a good way, and I think that's a little, that's a little secret about the success of tours. And we have very, very hardworking people, uh, a lot of excellent engineers. We're very curious, and we love new solutions. So mm. yeah, that's amazing. The, the reason I'm asking is because I mean, you are an, an 80 plus years old company, and you come from uh, the photographic industry, and and have a long history in imaging, and and also in ceramics, and and a, a lot of the areas that you cover today. And I was I was wondering uh, when you when you when you produce and you develop things, there must at some point there must be like being a a defining moment where Duos came from being one type of company to becoming the next type of company. I think there were, over the lifespan of the company, a couple of defining moments and uh, a couple of transitions which were, very, which were painful but necessary. So Durs in the very beginning was uh, basically had his offerings to end customers because uh, there was a point where we made cameras, where we made cameras and, and quite successfully cameras. But then cameras have been made in Japan a lot uh, cheaper, better, I don't know if better, but probably even better. I mean, we all know the guys <laughs> or we knew the guys. Uh, today it's more Apple than anyone else. And we had to transform into something different. And this transformation is, uh, is in the DNA of Durst. We look at markets, we say, okay, We've been there, we've done this, we're successful, but what is next? Keep the successful up, but do the next thing already. That's the, the constant change we are having. So, maybe not the secret, but maybe a curiosity for where the market is going? Which market? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the markets that you address. And the w I mean, when you start an R&D process on a new product, I take that you do some maybe some research, or yep. maybe you just think, okay, this is a good way to go. <laughs> I mean, we could build a machine and then look for a market. No, obviously we do some research. Yeah. And for us, the main directions where we're going right now is uh, packaging, yeah. if you want so. Yeah. So from label to flex pack yeah. to uh, corrugated, different forms of packaging. We do this uh, in the label uh, and flexible business alone. We do this in folding carton and then corrugated together with Koenig and Power. As you, as you know, we have a GV there. And we're looking into other forms of packaging, including metal and excluding nothing. That's one main direction. Then uh, we have a very, very uh, strong roots in industrial printing. So for us, industrial printing meaning ceramics. We're leading in ceramics. So we're one of the leading providers in ceramic uh, decoration printing. From there, we're going now into glaze printing, which means it's an industrial 3D. And from there, we go to other places, which I can tell you right now, but that's a direction where we're going, where mm. we're putting in. Mm. Plus, uh, one of our still main segments and still stable and actually right now, thankfully growing again as life is restarting is large format. Yeah. So these are our pillars where we're, yeah. we're moving. Plus, you can put add to the mix a textile, uh, I mean, industrial textile and uh, a very, very strong focus to software, but mm. software meaning things which help customers being successful. Mm. So from front end to, uh, if you want to call it uh, process software, RIP mm. software, but back end. Mm. There we are adding a couple of things. Not everything is known to the public yet, but uh, slowly. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The, the reason why I was asking about luck is because I didn't think it was luck only, but I was thinking that, as you said, the mountains and the, and the geography and also the cultural background and the company history plays a big role in defining you as a company, of course. Um, and I was, I was wondering, if, uh, if uh, w when you look at uh, recruiting people in a more rural area compared to if you were in a, in a really big city and uh, you know sometimes you have the universities just I mean how, how is it to get the right people because if, if it's not luck it's a, it's a, a good understanding of getting to your end decision or your end point right 
Uh, my preferred punchline is hope is no strategy that's close to luck so we don't hope we don't have luck in, in a certain yeah, way yeah, yeah. It, it is obviously we're, we're, we're trying to fish and harvest very early at the universities we are working with mm -hmm. you are right we do not have an immediate we're not sitting in the middle of of of, of, of a tech landscape, mm -hmm. this sometimes is uh, an advantage, but most of the t uh, it's a disadvantage. Most of the times, mm. ad it's in the middle. Yeah, yeah, advantage, yeah. disadvantage. I mean, um, but as you may see, even from the architecture and from what we're doing for this region here, we are a landmark and mm -hmm. we're quite attractive as a tech company. Yeah, we of course. We act as a tech company. Mm -hmm. So a lot of students coming out, even if they study, study in Munich or in Graz or in Milan, but mostly from the German speaking areas, mm -hmm. when they want to come back, yeah, because a lot yeah. of people from this region move out yeah. to Austria, Germany. Because the opportunities were not there when they were younger. Now you have been developing, now there is an opportunity. Now there is an opportunity. Yeah. And really, when they come back over the Brenner, so if you're driving from here, you see this thing here, yeah. and you are in tech, and you're one of the first addresses in this region where you want to work for. Mm. And Luckily for us, some of the people or most of the people already worked for some tech or automotive companies. So we have guys here from Audi, from BMW, which were there in development. Mm. They come back and they bring huge values mm. back to us. Mm. When you see the building, because you mentioned that, and, and the building is uh, become an icon for, for Durst, of course, and you use it in, on your website, you use it in your branding and everything like that, and it's a, it is a fantastic building. But it also shows a level of confidence that some of your competitors may not show the same way. How important is um, being an icon and being a front mover, in your opinion? This building now uh, was due because we have another iconic building in Austria as well. No, but I think, I personally think, and I was involved in every square meter here, that architecture is a universal language mm -hmm. which tells a story. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to tell a story to my competitor. I don't really care about that. No, no. But I, I was not asking you I to talk to anything <laughs> about that. I was more like, you know, you can, you can, some people live good silent and some people really uh, have the pride and, and show confidence in the market. And I think that the confidence that you show, I take that it also supports your story building, uh, your storytelling, right? I think so, yes, yeah. definitely. But the confidence I want to show is towards our own employees and towards our customers as well. So we are a rock, if you want so, but a beautiful rock <laughs> and, and the technology you can rely on. I mean, we are private. We're 100% family-owned company. Mm. I mean, we're two shareholders. Mm. Uh, we own this and this is over 80 years old and we are here to stay. Mm. So if you deal with us, you don't deal with a publicly traded company. If no. you deal with me as a CEO, I'm a co-owner and CEO, I'm here. I cannot escape it. So, and this confidence... It doesn't look like you're trying to either, right? <laughs> no, I'm not trying. <laughs> but, but this confidence we're showing as well architecture-wise. Mm. And I, I really, really want to have... This is built for my people. It's mm. not built for show. This no, no, bar no. here mm. is used for my guys. Yeah, yeah. Party tomorrow is yeah, yeah, yeah. for my guys. Yeah. Not for but the reason why I'm asking is because um, um, I think that everybody in the industry now knows Durst. And I don't know how many years back you have to go where not everybody knew you. So that is also like a journey. I mean, because when you move from one industry to an, more uh, segments in the, in the, I mean, even your, your payoff here in, in, in this uh, wonderful room is ready to print. And that is what you do. That is what, you, what defines you as a company right now. So, so I think I, when I ask you these questions is because I, I think that when customers have the trust in investing in your products, investing in your software, investing in your services, it's because you have been able to bring that confidence from your staff and from yourself to the market, right? Yeah. I, Does it make sense what I'm asking? Or it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Okay. It's just uh, that, uh, you know, I have to, to reflect myself a little bit, but mm. yes, definitely. Should we have a uh, toast on that? Oh yeah, yeah we should. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Cheers. Good to, Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Mm. What are we drinking, uh, Christoph? Canel Bosco is a Francia Corta. Mm -hmm. It's not from South Tyrol. Later we're gonna try a South Tyrol, okay, okay. but it's, it's it's a real good Francia Corta. It's like a champenoise from uh, from Italy. Mm. I, I like it very lot, but I, I was just distracting you right now. So yeah, let's no. get back on track, right? <laughs> oh, good. No, getting back on track. Um, yes. I mean, you earn customers. You don't get them by luck, right? No, we don't get them by luck. Yeah. 
I mean, first of all, we don't 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 let the the, the buildings or the architecture um, lead to something where we say, yeah, they have nice architecture, but they didn't, they don't build nice machine processes. <laughs> that would be a so, shame, right? <laughs> so uh, I mean, if if we walk into into the part where we build the machines, if we walk into the part where we do the demonstrations, if customers come here, mm. they see this is a seamless integration. Mm. Our design on the machine is as careful as our design on the architecture, as mm. careful as the desks where people are working, and as careful as we treat our family. So it is a language we're talking, mm. and, and the buildings are just another expression or, or a culture of this language, mm. I would say. And thankfully, now answering your question, the market seems to appreciate the language we're talking. So we have most more or less all of our customers come once in their lifespan here to Brixen and they appreciate that this is welcoming, that is what it is. And when I started, it was a completely different start. Mm. So. Talking about your products, um, how difficult how difficult is it to, to develop and be on the edge of uh, the technology when in this uh, in the segment you address? So usually we say a uh, new product, new segment, five years. Five and years. Uh, then anywhere from five to 25 millions and then you have a first product and then you need another two years until everything is more or less settled and then you can start mm -hmm. to get into a payback. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a little bit different as we are a family company. We, we really look into periods pre-COVID of seven to 10 years. If we address a market, mm -hmm. we usually bite in and we stay there. Mm -hmm. We do a, a very, very, very strict segmentation. So we identify where is the niche for us where we can do, let's say anywhere from 50 to 500 machines, which are from anywhere from 400,000 to 2 million. Yeah. This is, we're gonna target, we address it and there we stay yeah. laser sharp. And yeah. there we are number one or number two. Yeah. If you're not able to do this, we drop out and do something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because this wouldn't, and I, I do understand that, and I, I, I think that is a good approach. I mean, I, my mind is probably not important, yet, but I was, I was a little bit curious about. Um, I mean, because if you look at the printing industry, let's say twenty-five years ago, it was an extremely mechanical industry, right? Mm -hmm. Then it becomes like electromechanical kind of industry. Then it became like a computer-driven, uh, and maybe today it's, of course, it's a very customer-centric driven industry and I was I was just wondering because if you if you look at the quality of, of, of the output of your machines for example it is where most people probably say can get better right so where so where where is the technology in your in very broad perspective where do you think it's uh, the difficulties or the challenges and how to uh, to get the appreciation from the market in a future perspective I think there are two 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 factors to it one factor is uh, Yes, inkjet, digital inkjet is out of the baby shoes. The quality can maybe get better, but we are there where you say the quality has a level where it can stick for a while. Yeah. And yes, you can always do improvement. But the other factor is, as you said, years ago you were talking about other things. I think 2014 we started our own software companies, mm -hmm. which by now are quite big for our dimensions. Mm -hmm to go to, to, to something different. We said, mm -hmm. okay, we know how to build machines. We make them better anyhow, the iterations of them, but now we have to work on the process. Mm -hmm. And working on the process does not mean build better or faster machines, means you need to build uh, software hardware systems mm -hmm. around which allow you to process faster and at the end of the day, more profitable. Mm -hmm. So this is our aim. We mm -hmm. still, uh, build the best machines and we'll continue this course, but yeah. but now we're starting to to focus around the process we we, we try as you say customer centric i would say yes customer centric but also process sensitive yeah 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 and this is this is where we're going yeah, this is where yeah. we're putting our effort in. so to i mean so just if i should put it in words that i understand uh, so basically that is like the if you think of the hardware as a platform uh, and the the software as the kind of driver for your business. Basically, that is like making sure that those technologies bridges even better together to make sure that everything from the business perspective to the processes to the uh, quality control to every, I mean, all the things that you do, that is like, that is the next big step to make sure that it works. 
definitely that yeah. that is the next big step okay. i mean there there you can fantasize then what what else you could do with it you if i mean there's a lot of talks about automated integrated production mm. and so on but mm. yes definitely you want to make it easier to run to control to control the output because if you think back a little bit what Let's take a moment with uh, large format printing. When the first large format printers, they didn't print uh, pictures, they print the gold basically yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. you know the margins were huge. And but then things change more. A competition comes in, and and so slowly, slowly, uh, it's not a matter if you print the nicest print it mm. is how efficient you do it for mm. the application you mm. need it mm. and i think that's the difference mm. now now we're getting into into a more industrialized thinking mm. and christoph um one of the things that i know a lot of people have paid attention to is um, that you have an open very open-minded culture when it comes to cooperating with other companies uh, it's not a secret that you are working with uh, Fujifilm on the on the print heads. It's not a secret that you work with Koenig and Bauer on on some new uh, co venture kind of products. What does that openness? Is that something that you think is is an essential part of your culture, or is it just a necessity? We, we had to we had to learn it the hard. Unfair way. question, right? <laughs> no, well, it's an unfair. No, it, it is it is. We had to learn it the hard way. I, yeah. I think that uh, challenges. If you really want to be really really good about the, about the. Within the value chain of a customer, you need to cooperate with others because you cannot do everything and you're not going to be the best in every different angle. So when we talk, for example, about our software workflows, we integrate a lot of technologies from the best around the world. Mm. And so at a certain point, I said, I cannot address the packaging market by myself, for mm. example, folding mm. carton. I can't also because it's a huge machine. market, right? It's I mean, huge. Yeah. And I mean, we're a little private company, mm. very small. So. This is, but we know a couple of things maybe better than others, and mm. so uh, you know, you know, you know, we started to think: should we, could we, shall we? And and uh, and you decided to uh, go that way, right? It took a good bottle of white wine and, and a couple <laughs> of dinners. No, no, to really and someone in front of me who I who I trusted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, trust is for us as as as, as, as this little company, this little big company some very, very essential things. So I look carefully who I cooperate with or who I don't cooperate with. Mm. But yes, mm. it is in the DNA to cooperate mm. as well. Mm. Fantastic. Let's talk about uh, the future. I mean, uh, one thing is we just spoke a little bit about the products and things like that. But if you look in a, in a I mean, some segments in the industry are decreasing markets. Uh, maybe not so much the segments that you are addressing, uh, because you've been good at addressing like the label segment and the textile segment and the, large format and now packaging and also I mean it seems that all the segments that you're addressing are not decreasing but the market is decreasing in general uh, for commercial print um, and uh, and I was wondering uh, being a private owned company does that uh, influence how you see your your longer perspective of being a, a major supplier in the industry it doesn't it does not but mm. I mean <laughs> Obviously, we uh, we we identify identify we try to identify sectors which are growing, and we are very well aware of what's going on mm. uh, left and right in in the in the printing fields. But as I told you before, large format for us is right now rock solid and growing again. But the big market is definitely one of the big markets is packaging, mm. and the other one is industrial printing. Mm. Now, mm. if it's textile, if it's this or this, mm. we have the engines ready for it. But thinking into the future and beyond just software and process and, mm. and supply chain, I'm and it's 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 quite well known uh, that I am a big believer in uh, 3D printing, mm. but. A little bit different, maybe than anyone else. And mm. if you sit here next year, I'm gonna show you a mm. lot more. Mm. <laughs> I, I, <don't> think, <laughs> I, I hope to be here next year. That that would be awesome. But I was I was thinking, if you look a little bit more than on the product side and look a little bit further in the future, because I mean, uh, some companies believe that their future is becoming a public company, and because sometimes it can raise the money that you need. But you you emphasize that the value of being a private company because you can make the decisions yeah. without talking to anybody but yourself and your board, right? And, and so I was just thinking that if the market becomes even more competitive and the investments in new R&D is becoming much bigger than today because everything gets a little bit more difficult, right? Uh, or challenging. Uh, I was mm -hmm. just wondering, do you, you see yourself also in a long-term perspective as a private-owned company? 
I mean, as for now, yes, definitely yeah. yes. Yeah. But uh, to give you the perspective from my side, we are participating, I think, in 25, 35 different startups where we're seeding and where oh, we're Okay, so you also, also with, help other startups, basically. Active, active yeah. very active in, in, in the startup world. And we even have, uh, I mean, uh, Harald and, and Diamond Wolf, and it's uh, Tyrolean Business Angel. We do, we do seed, we do startup, we go, we, we start up our own companies. I cannot tell you if Durst will be private in no. 100 years, but no. I can tell you yeah. one thing, in 10 years we will still be private. Yeah. And what's then? I don't know. Yeah, no. I mean, I, I know it was an impossible, impossible question. The reason why I was thinking about it, because you know, in the, in the very first question I had to you was about luck, right? And we, we, we kind of crossed that out and said that it was uh, more a question about being clever and having the right people and, and have the right, right mindset for the market. And now when I ask you about the future in that perspective, it's because, I mean, when you as a manager and as a, a co-owner of uh, Durst is looking into the future, it, it might be interesting for people to understand that, that, that the opportunities that you see in the market can be actually developed, mm -hmm. produced, delivered, even though you're not a public company, because I think it gives a lot of confidence that you have your you have your you have your own hand on the boilerplate, so to speak, right? Yeah, but but this is why I did, for example, this joint venture with Koenig and Power because I said this is a, a huge chance for something us to where you can share some of the risk, also maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I can say, okay, but you are that bigger. You are public, so go take, take the advantage from the public, but stay private, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and this is this is. I mean, there are there are more from. I'm not, this is not the emphasis to stay private forever, but no. for us, it's a big advantage. Yeah. We just, we are simply able to move faster than yeah. a lot of other people. Yeah. I mean, with all the respect for all public companies, uh, yeah. if you look at Apple and others, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. hugely successful, oh, yeah. but we decide our own fate and we like this mm -hmm. for now very much. The next generation, I don't know. No, Maybe no, they don't like not. it anymore. So uh, personally, where do you see yourself in, a, in the next uh, two, five, 10 years? Two, five, ten years, I will be uh, around the world as I always have been. Uh, I will be working as mm, well, a couple <laughs> of years CEO, but then go back more in an advisory role. I think we will, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you.